Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar. Today is the first webinar organized together by Jus Mundi and the Ukrainian Arbitration Association. And I would like to thank Jus Mundi for their idea and for the topic for this webinar. Today we will discuss quite a controversial topic and uh, for the last couple of years we have been win witnessing different institutions, uh, actors in arbitration, practitioners coming up with the new ideas, new initiatives, how to make uh, arbitration process more transparent. And today we will address whether uh, transparency is transparent in arbitration from a different point of views from a point of view of a practitioner of an institution and the legal tech. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can ask them on the right in a, on YouTube. There is a box for your questions and we will ask them at the end of the webinar. My name is Anna Giar Sashko. I am a board member of the Ukrainian Arbitration Association and I will be moderating today's uh, discussion with uh, Dmitro Koba, who is international business developer at uh, Jus Mundi. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction, Anna, and good afternoon, everyone. So first of all, I also would like to thank the Ukrainian Arbitration Association for co-organizing this webinar with us, and uh, actually especially Anna for putting this together. Uh, as Anna mentioned, we decided to look into the topic of uh, transparency from different perspective today. And for this, we have our great speakers. So uh, please let me introduce uh, them to you. So we have uh, Irina Moroz, who is a partner at AGA Partners, a law firm in Kiev. And she will discuss the topic from the council's perspective. Uh, we also have Sergei Melnik, who is a uh, lawyer qualified in Ukraine and France and currently serving as a deputy counsel in the International Court of uh, Arbitration of the ICC in Paris. And his duties include management of the ICC cases with parties residing in the CIS region and the Eastern European bloc. And he will address the topic from institutions perspective. And we also have uh, Jean-Rémy de Mestre, who is international lawyer, CEO and co-founder of uh, Yusmondi, a Paris-based international legal tech. And uh, JR will tackle the topic from the legal tech perspective. So I suggest that we start with uh, Irina. Uh, so Irina, please, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, to Ukrainian Arbitration Association, Anna and Metro for invitation uh, to speak today. And we have a very interesting topic and it is rather controversial topic, transparency in arbitration. So I'm going to deal uh, about uh, this issue from the perspective of counsel acting on behalf of the parties in arbitration. Of course, when we are speaking about transparency, it usually involves uh, different sides of transparency. And the first question arises, why do we need transparency in arbitration? Because uh, in its essence, basically, uh, arbitration should be confidential and uh, one of the uh, most uh, prominent uh, privilege of arbitration is confidential of this process. But nevertheless, uh, nowadays arbitration uh, become more and more open. Why it is so? Uh, because um, lawyers want to have more uh, access to the arbitral awards. They want to have more information about arbitrators they are nominating an arbitration uh, process uh, as overall. Um, this uh, involves uh, the, the issue of uh, uh, confidence in arbitration process and predictability of arbitration process. Therefore, arbitration community nowadays put efforts in order uh, to open this closed arbitration club and uh, to, to make it more open for arbitration practitioners and from the society. The next aspect of uh, transparency is diversity, because uh, we want uh, to, uh, to develop diversity in arbitration and we want to, need, uh, to see new faces. It is impossible to reach this development without transparency, because uh, everyone wants at least to have some information regarding, for example, the number of male and female arbitrators that are acting under certain arbitration institution, 
nationality of arbitrators that are involved in this case. And this purpose might be achieved only with the transparency. The next uh, uh, angel of transparency is the collection of information during arbitrator appointment procedure. It is very important for counsel uh, at a few stages. The first, at the stage of appointment of arbitrator, when you need to collect as more as possible information concerning the uh, possible arbitrator. Why this information is important? Because when you are appointing arbitrator, you want to have a certain reliance that uh, he will um, act fairly, independently, and uh, you have certain predictability concerning the opinions that he might achieve. For example, if you have access to the previous award of arbitration that were issued, you can somehow predict his opinion in this certain case. Of course, you cannot expect that your nominated arbitrator will advocate your case and will defend your client, but uh, you could have some predictability. Another aspect uh, that um, you should collect information about the arbitrator that is appointed by the other party or by arbitration institution in case you have reasons to doubt that this arbitrator is impartial and uh, independent and you have a basis to challenge this arbitrator. In order to make this, of course, you need additional information about previous engagement of this arbitrator in uh, arbitration proceedings, about the number of appointments he has now accepted, uh, about his previous engagement with the parties as an expert, as an arbitrator, or as a consul. In order to achieve all these purposes, nowadays we have certain instruments that collect, advocate, uh, and counsels uh, to, um, to allocate uh, this information. Uh, first of all, we have uh, certain uh, rules concerning uh, obligation of arbitrators to disclose uh, information in order to prevent any conflict of interest during arbitration proceedings. Uh, of course, we have uh, such uh, tools that everybody knows, for instance, IBA guidelines on conflict of interest in international arbitration that gives a fundamental basis as to the possible conflict and obligation of arbitrator to give disclosure. Uh, we have, uh, um, uh, for example, a GAR arbitrator's research tools that give opportunity uh, to collect some information about uh, arbitrators, their nationality, gender, and so on. Uh, we have a new introduced artificial intelligent questionnaire by Queen Mary University that is a, 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 a tool, again, to collect some information about arbitrators, uh, their experience, uh, the arbitrators' procedures they were involved, and so on. Of course, my colleague will uh, develop these in instruments in more detail, and they will describe new tools, for instance, that are available in USMONDI or, or from uh, ICC institutions. Uh, today, I would like uh, to speak more about, uh, as well, obligation of arbitrator to disclose uh, uh, certain information in arbitration procedure, uh, because this issue is very important and it is, as well, uh, a fundamental aspect of transparency. Of course, when we agree to resolve the dispute in arbitration, we expect arbitrator to be independent, impartial, and to act fairly. And this principle, uh, they are introduced uh, by basic um, arbitration instruments such as UNCITRAL modern law, uh, IBA guidelines, and uh, uh, arbitration new, uh, rules of numerous arbitration institutions. Uh, for instance, SCC, ICC rules, LCA rules, they contain a certain requirement concerning arbitration independence, impartiality, and uh, neutrality. Uh, of course, as the lawyers, we should understand that the concept uh, of arbitrator's independence is different uh, from the concept of impartiality, because independence uh, concerns the personal relations between arbitrator and engaged parties or arbitration institutions. 
an arbitrator is obliged to disclose any information concerning his previous engagement with the party uh, or uh, any relation with arbitration institution. When we are speaking about impartiality, uh, that's uh, concerned the measure of mind of arbitrator, uh, meaning that his personal approach uh, towards the certain disputes or the certain matters. For instance, if arbitrator has previously expressed a certain opinion concerning the possible merits of the case or the perspectives of the dispute, uh, this might um, be considered uh, as uh, his certain uh, impartial uh, attitude in this dispute and might preclude him to act as an arbitrator. Uh, under the English Arbitrator, uh, Arbitration Act, uh, we have uh, only a requirement for arbitrator to be impartial. Um, that meaning that uh, arbitrator might be removed, uh, whereas the circumstances give rise to justifiable doubts as to his impartiality. And I would like to deal more uh, with the recent case that was considered uh, in English court, uh, the case uh, involved uh, insurance uh, dispute. It is the case between Halliburton uh, versus Chubb. In this case, English court analyzed the obligation of arbitrator concerning disclosure of certain information uh, and his ability to get to act as an arbitrator when he has uh, numerous appointments. This, uh, word, um, th this court order, uh, court decision, is very important um, from the perspective of different arbitration institutions that accept disputes that are seated in London. For instance, uh, the dispute under LCAA rule, ICC rules, GAFTA, MIA, and so on. And the facts of this case are uh, rather interesting. Uh, because uh, the dispute arose between uh, the two companies, uh, Halliburton versus Chubb, and the dispute arose in 2015 uh, because of uh, explosion in um, because of a certain accident in a, a deep water horizon explosion. And uh, the dispute relates to indemnification in respect of settlements between these two companies, between Halliburton and Chubb. Uh, the parties could not settle the dispute uh, through negotiation and the matter was brought to arbitration. Arbitration was London-based, it was ad hoc arbitration. Uh, it was commenced in January 2015 uh, and New, New York law was to apply to this dispute. So the parties each nominated one uh, arbitrator and uh, they could not agree on the appointment of the chairman of the presiding arbitrator. Um, and the matter was brought to English court and the high court um, appointed presiding arbitrator. And uh, uh, during the course of the arbitration procedure, uh, it uh, was revealed that the presiding arbitrator has previously accepted appointment uh, from one of the party, uh, from the company uh, Chu, and the arbitrator was acted uh, in a few disputes uh, involving this company. And after he accepted his appointment as a chairman, he accepted a two more disputes involving this accident. One dispute uh, was um, with involvement of uh, the company Tube, and he was nominated by this company as an arbitrator on their side. And another dispute uh, concerned the same accident, but uh, absolutely different company. And of course, Halliburton uh, decided to challenge arbitrator appointment based on the reason that arbitrator failed to disclose that he acts as arbitrator uh, in a numerous appointments uh, that were made <coughs> sorry, uh, uh, by the uh, opponents. And uh, another factor is that he might be impartial uh, and of course, they applied uh, to the English court to revoke appointed arbitrator. Uh, 
The matter was considered by the first instance court, then it went to the Court of Appeal, and finally it ended at the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court um, um, answered uh, two questions, whether the arbitrator was obliged at the time of his appointment to disclose information as to his previous appointments that were made uh, in the similar dispute uh, by the opponents, the first answer, and whether he could continue to act as a presiding arbitrator in the circumstances where he has accepted numerous appointments in the particularly the same dispute. And when um, deciding this case, the Supreme Court, uh, first of all, uh, analyzed obligation of arbitrator as to disclosure. And the um, finding of the court was that uh, arbitrator should disclose uh, the circumstances of his uh, nomination in a dispute with the same parties. And this obligation of disclosure is uh, continuing, is pending. It means that arbitration should disclose not only the disputes that are current and uh, valid at the time of his appointment, but even after his appointment, if he accepts new disputes, with the same parties that are acting in the arbitration, or he should disclose this information. And uh, the court uh, put a heavy weight on the failure of arbitrator to disclose uh, this information. But nevertheless, the court declined to revoke this arbitrator because uh, the court generally uh, analyzed the circumstances of this case and. Uh, decided that previously there was no a certain judicial guidance as to obligation of arbitrator to disclose this information. And of course, this nominated arbitrator was not uh, absolutely obliged to disclose uh, all his similar appointments. The next uh, um, point that influenced uh, the, this judgment was the explanations that were provided by arbitrator. Because when this issue was raised, arbitrator explained that he did not uh, disclose that he was appointment, uh, appointed uh, in a dispute with the same party, because uh, this additional appointment uh, were made after he was appointed as a presiding arbitrator in a current dispute. And the second step, he explained that uh, the dispute in other appointments uh, should be decided as a preliminary uh, issues without considering of party submissions. So his position was that there will be no uh, bias or um, uh, impartiality um, um, breach from his side because he was ready uh, to resign on his own, even if the matter will go uh, to be dealt on a submission. And the court, uh, of course, uh, analyzed this whole attitude of the arbitrator and decided that the arbitrator acted fairly and he did not uh, want to hide some additional information. He disclosed uh, these circumstances when the matter um, went to the English court and uh, uh, in the court declined uh, to revoke this arbitrator. And from this case, we could make a certain important conclusion. So the first of all, the arbitrator has obligation to disclose uh, all his appointments uh, with uh, similar parties that are involved in the dispute. Uh, and if he fails to disclose this information, it might give rise to his challenge and his revocation. And the second important conclusion that was made by the court, and it concerns the question whether arbitrator could act uh, as appointed arbitrator in numerous disputes. And uh, English court uh, decided that it was not a problem at all because uh, there is no limitation concerning the number of appointments the arbitrator could accept because each case is decided independently and arbitrator should decide each case with an open mind. 
it means that there is no limitation for instance that arbitrator could accept only 10 or 12 appointments or depending on his case law he can accept as many appointments as he want but when he is accepting he should disclose information concerning his appointment involving the same party uh, and uh, I think that uh, we should take into account uh, this um, judgment during appointing of arbitrator or when we are estimating any grounds to challenge the appointment of the other party. Uh, and this um, judgment has a very important influence on the transparency in international arbitration. At as it explains uh, the basic principles of disclosure uh, that is very important to provide confidentiality uh, in the whole arbitration procedure. So that's, uh, I think, the main points I wanted to disclose, and I will be pleased to answer any additional questions that, uh, that we have. Irina, thank you for this insightful presentation and for detailed description of different concerns. I hope that we will have uh, a lot of questions from the audience because, as you said, uh, this is this topic is very controversial and uh, appointment of arbitrators is uh, became as a separate science itself. Uh, and now we turn to the point of view of institutions. Sergei, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. I prepared a small presentation if she, I would like to share with you. Just give me a second, please. Can you see it? Should it appear now? Yes. Yes, Great. we do. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, I would, I would like to just go quickly through the main initiatives that ICC has developed over the, the recent years in the area of transparency, and we have several of them indeed. Uh, the first one is a very, I, I believe, very useful tool for, for lawyers who are searching uh, who to appoint as an arbitrator in their proceedings, for example, in ICC or even, even other proceedings. Um, it's called Arbitrator's List. And um, starting from 2016, we are constantly developing it and we're adding new features and new information which are now shared online. For example, uh, starting from 2016, we are sharing you know, the main uh, points on arbitrators like their names, nationalities, role in the tribunal and whether arbitration is pending or not. And uh, in 2020 and 21, we added new features, like for example, industry sector, uh, which law firms are involved and their representatives. And uh, also we are now sharing the names of administrative secretaries uh, for the reason that uh, these people also gain a lot of experience uh, online and many of them will become also arbitrators uh, very soon. And it's quite useful for the parties to know where this person acted before, before serving as arbitrator. So this tool uh, is available on our website, it's free of charge, and is constantly updated uh, for the proceedings. Obviously, if the proceeding is considered to be confidential or the parties uh, do not agree to share this information, then this information will not be put online because uh, as we already touched upon, uh, as Irina touched upon already, there is also an issue of confidentiality, which also always go along with transparency. And our role as institution is to protect parties' interests uh, before uh, moving to a public interest as such. Uh, second issue, uh, which we're now providing, uh, starting from recently, are the reasons, of course, decisions. And actually, our 2021 version of the rules was amended, and now we have a special article in one of the appendixes, it's appendix two, uh, where we state uh, basically what uh, decisions can, can, for what decisions the reasons of the court can be given. Before we mentioned it already in the note to the parties and arbitral tribunals, it's like a, uh, basically a, a document uh, which does not form the part of the rules, but uh, which is a good guidance for the parties and tribunals on how to conduct arbitration. 
but now this provision became an obligatory part basically of the of the sec rules and uh, what what does it provide it for example allows uh, for the parties to find out the reasons based on which the um, court decided for example on the challenge of an arbitrator or on the constitution of the whole tribunal where there is an issue uh, with, there is some issue with um, you know appointing or confirming some of the arbitrators uh, or uh, for example decisions on the article 64 is whether the arbitration can actually proceed based on jurisdictional objections for example of one of the parties or non-participating uh, party and uh, there are a couple of conditions which uh, should be fulfilled for that uh, first one is that such a request should come in advance so before the court actually makes the decision this is to avoid abuses uh, when you know unsatisfied party uh, who, um, who who finds that decision was uh, was made not in its favor will try to fish for you know for basis to uh, to attack either tribunal or the court afterwards in courts for example uh, it should be you know it should, such decisions such requests should come in advance before the actual you know result is already known to the parties and also court uh, to prevent any abuses court also guards uh, the full discretion on whether to give reasons or not I mean, uh, obviously, the court will never use this discretion unless there are, you know, serious grounds not to give reasons. So far, I haven't seen in my cases even once for the court to refuse giving the reasons, and we and we give indeed from time to time in my cases. And uh, as you see uh, in the, on the right part uh, slide, we, we see that there is actually uh, quite a big number of cases where we granted the court granted uh, the reasons and gave the reasons for its decisions uh, on different uh, you know uh, decisions of the court, mostly challenges, but also others. So it's indeed a useful tool for the parties to be aware of the reasons of the court. Um, then uh, also. Very briefly, it was already discussed by Irina, but I will put focus on exactly SEC proceedings, which might be useful for, for litigators and arbitrators involved in our cases, uh, how disclosure is made under the SEC rules. So obviously, uh, we have the same standard uh, as in other institutions, the tribunal should be, an arbitrator should be impartial and independent. Uh, but we have some you know, specific uh, approach to that. For example, uh, arbitrator equals in our understanding to the arbitrator's law firm. It means that if a law firm was involved with a particular party, this should be normally disclosed uh, in arbitrator's statement. It's, it is not enough to say, I am not the law firm, I am just a partner or an employee of a law firm, so I, we are separate uh, for the SEC court. Uh, it's basically the same. Uh, also, uh, we include affiliates of the legal entity, so parts of the groups of the companies, for example, because obviously there is some element of control and cooperation between these uh, companies, uh, which may lead to um, either actual bias or basis for the bias. And also, disclosure is not enough to be made at the beginning of the proceeding, it's ongoing duty, so at any time, arbitrator when it becomes aware he or she becomes aware of some facts that need to be disclosed they should be disclosed indeed um, the new uh, point which was added very recently just starting from january 2021 in our new version of the rules is that now also for the reasons of transparency uh, there should be disclosure of uh, any involvement of third party funders in uh, icc proceedings and it this, basically, uh, this principle, this provision came from the practice because in, may, in some cases we saw the situations where tribunals could not do any, any you know, meaningful disclosure because they had no idea who was funding one of the parties. And often uh, big arbitrators uh, are also consulting or actually employed by, uh, by third party funding funds. Uh, in order to basically provide them, you know, uh, expertise on whether to take cases, whether to, whether to uh, you know, sponsor the proceedings or not, based on the potential outcomes, and uh, this might indeed create uh, conflicts of interest, which should be uh, known to the parties and also to tribunal. That's why this you know, this provision was added, and um, also. I will not go through the whole list, it's quite long, but just to mention that 
in ICC node to tribunals and the parties I mentioned before, we have a list of issues and points that arbitrators should consider when they think whether to make a disclosure. But unlike IBA uh, guidelines, uh, we don't have you know, rigid uh, standards like that some points should be disclosed after three years, for example, appointment um, in, in a case involving the party. There are no deadlines as such, it's for tribunal, it's for arbitrators to personally assess what they, what they think uh, is actually uh, should be disclosed and what is minor and should not. Of course, um, we hope this is uh, of use for them. Uh, one more point um, which we are currently working on is also publication of awards. Uh, and uh, we, we're giving, it started, the whole procedure started in 2019, and we're giving two years of cooling off period for the awards before they become published in order to, for the parties to react. And also during the whole process, process of, uh, you know, constitution of tribunal, uh, issuing of terms of reference, rendering the awards, we are always reminding in our correspondence to the parties that parties can object to publication and then nothing will be published. Parties can also limit you know, the scope of publication. They, for example, can anonymize uh, their names or any names of any companies in the proceedings. So basically making it very difficult to identify to whom the case relates. Uh, and uh, like to publish on the part of the awards also, for example. So there are many ways uh, basically to accommodate the need of society of transparency or basically of building up a case law of ICC cases, which are actually quite important source of, uh, uh, of case law as such. And uh, because of publication, because of actually uh, many awards going public uh, through enforcement proceedings, uh, these cases afterwards cited in textbooks, for example. So why should we not give, uh, you know, even more resources uh, for researchers, for students, for lawyers to rely on, on awards which have no reasons to be uh, confidential and where parties do not object. Uh, so that's why we, uh, this basically was established. Um, this procedure was established and it, for now it were, it, we're starting actually to prepare the first round of, public, of published awards, which we hope to, uh, to put soon on our website. And also last point, uh, very briefly, is public, publication of our statistics. So regularly we are issuing bulletins where we put um, you know, general statistics in ICC cases as to gender of arbitrators, for example, as to nationality of the parties, as to the type of cases involved, as to the amount of disputes, uh, and other other inf quite important information for for the general public, which also we hope promotes transparency. At least it's our aim, and uh, which we basically are preparing regularly. We have a special department working on that constantly. Uh, thank you very much. I guess, I hope I, I managed to reply uh, on this on this very important topic of transparency. But I'm I will welcome any questions in this regard. Thanks, uh, Sergey, for your insightful presentation. We have a question from the audience, but I will ask it uh, maybe after our next uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, uh, Jeremy, and he will tackle the point of transparency from. Uh, legal tech perspective as uh, you know that there are a lot of data uh, in the internet uh, which one is more accessible another one is less accessible and it's interesting to know how uh, legal tech companies can contribute also to the question of transparency um, in arbitration so uh, Jeremy the screen or floor is yours thank you David for, for the introduction uh, and uh, thank you uh, to Anna and to the Ukrainian Arbitration uh, Association for, for this invitation to discuss uh, this topic, which is, uh, as you can imagine, also super uh, uh, important uh, to us. Um, I think that uh, uh, Usfundi, as it exists today, uh, will not exist if uh, this movement in favor of transparency uh, will not have been um, uh, initiated uh, a few years ago. Uh, we can probably discuss of, uh, from where uh, it comes and the role that uh, investment arbitration played uh, into uh, this uh, this movement, uh, and also the, all the issues of, uh, of conflicts of interest. But uh, the the truth is that today uh, there is a movement uh, all over the world 
uh, the ICC, of course, uh, has been and is uh, uh, one of the uh, um, instigators of, um, of uh, this, uh, this movement. Um, and, uh, and we are very um, happy to be able to, to participate uh, through, uh, through this, uh, uh, this transparency. So today I will uh, briefly uh, go through uh, three uh, points. Uh, the first one is what, what, uh, how do we find some information on arbitration uh, at Tusmundi? And so from where do, do we find the data? Um, second, I would just give you uh, some statistics about uh, what uh, quantity and diversity of uh, information we could uh, uh, collect, and especially for commercial arbitration, because I believe that's uh, the most uh, surprising uh, or the where we can see the biggest change uh, for the past years. Uh, and finally, just discuss uh, what can be the impact, for one of the impacts of uh, these changes uh, that are happening. So for the first part, I will uh, briefly uh, share my screen as well, but not for a presentation, just to uh, to, to uh, illustrate with some information uh, uh, from uh, our uh, uh, website. Can you see my screen? Okay. Um, so uh, I will take a few examples to show you uh, the different sources uh, of information that we, that we use at USMUNI. And we use uh, basically three, uh, three sources. The first one is uh, uh, the one that Sergei uh, presented. Uh, these are the institutions. And this is, of course, what we did uh, first. Uh, so at the beginning, we started for with investment arbitration. So of course, the sources were uh, Exceed mainly, uh, PCA, um, uh, especially Exceed and PCA. Um, and uh, so we were collecting on the uh, institution website, uh, the uh, awards, but also the information relating to the cases. And I think it's super important to have uh, the two in mind, uh, publication of award is one uh, part, but publication of uh, information relating to the cases is uh, equally important. Uh, and uh, if you see, uh, for instance, these uh, four cases with ICC case number uh, 1691, so this comes from the ICC arbitral uh, tribunal database that Sergei presented. Um, and you, what you find on Newsmundi is uh, approximately the same information. So it is presented this way, you know, uh, the arbitrators, uh, the, the council, so far, I mean, the, the firm and, and, the, uh, and the country, as well as the date of introduction. So uh, the, we, we collect uh, from different uh, databases like the ICC, and we include uh, directly uh, this information um, into USMUNDI. And with the movement uh, that, uh, you know, ICC initiated also with what we see in, uh, in investment arbitration, well, but this quantity of uh, information is becoming uh, much more important. And there is, of course, a, a room of improvement. Uh, if uh, all the other institutions uh, would follow uh, what ICC have been doing, uh, this quantity of information will be even more impressive. Um, from what I understand, uh, many institutions are very interested in, uh, in following uh, this, uh, this movement. Several already uh, did it. Huh? Uh, I think uh, VIAC, the BNI International Arbitration Center, started to publish some information about the composition of tribunal. Um, um, the uh, CAM, uh, uh, institution in Brazil, also the CAM CCBC, uh, started also to, to publish information about, uh, about uh, some um, uh, composition of tribunal. So, uh, and I, from what I hear, uh, some other big institutions are interested in, in doing it. So I believe uh, that uh, this uh, source will continue to increase. But of course, here we are mainly talking about the second category of information, uh, uh, information about the cases, not uh, the awards themselves, because the confidentiality uh, is preventing institutions to do it, which is, I believe, uh, uh, normal and should continue. But uh, I think the, the change that we are seeing now is that uh, we, we are more and more considering that uh, this is not a breach of confidentiality. These are just uh, metadata, like information relating to these cases uh, that do not really concern parties. Uh, and are uh, very useful to prevent uh, conflict of interest, but also uh, for uh, arbitrators to highlight what they do, uh, and especially young arbitrators that can uh, now, you know, show that okay, we have been appointed in a uh, in a case at the ICC, so uh, we we have the experience, uh, and you can maybe appoint us uh, in uh, other uh, uh, cases. It is also a good way to know uh, the caseload of an arbitrator, which can be uh, sometimes an issue uh, um, for, for parties and some useful information for them. So first source, um, 
institution uh, websites uh, and the information that they would like to, to publish. Uh, the second source of information uh, that uh, we are using uh, on Newsmundi uh, is uh, the uh, national um, enforcement and set aside proceedings. And uh, if you see on my screen, uh, you see many uh, um, here municipal judgments, for instance, from Singapore, from Paris, uh, from the District of Columbia, etc., etc. And this uh, um, sources of, of documents so allows us to, to uh, collect uh, the municipal cases themselves. And sometimes the award, because in several jurisdictions, when you uh, want to uh, uh, ask for an enforcement of the proceedings, uh, you have to produce the, the award. So after we can uh, collect uh, this information and include them uh, into use media. And I will give you after a few uh, uh, data about how many uh, documents we could, uh, we could find. Um, so of course it has always uh, existed. I, I discussed uh, recently with a, with a partner from a firm who told me, oh yeah, like uh, 15 years ago, we, have, we were looking through PACER, we, we had uh, this spreadsheet with a, uh, a lot of uh, uh, information that we collected. Uh, and, uh, and by the way, we, we could with them also find some awards that we were not able uh, to find. Uh, and so of course, everyone uh, was able to do it, but uh, the difficulty to find the award, to, uh, uh, to, to access them and to, and to build a database, which is easily uh, usable after, uh, was too big. Uh, to to um, to have uh, this kind of uh, of solution, so um, there is nothing new. It just maybe that the data is more easily available and the technology is uh, making it possible to uh, to easily uh, uh, aggregate this information and and make a, a useful tool uh, based on that. So the second source of information is uh, municipal uh, proceedings. The first source of information of information um, is um, a partnership that we built with IBA, um, but also something that we started uh, to build uh, um, that we were doing already uh, at USMD is a collaborative aspect, uh, because uh, you have a certain number of commercial arbitration awards that uh, have never been confidential or that were not uh, confidential for for uh, several reasons, and also some municipal cases that are super helpful. Uh, that uh, are actually available somewhere and uh, often on the computer of the lawyers that participated in these uh, cases, but they are not accessible to anyone because they, uh, you know, once again, uh, this kind of uh, um, database wa was not existing. Uh, IBA was working on a project to make, uh, to collect this information and to make it uh, available. And so we, we partner to uh, uh, upload directly the document on Newsmundi. Uh, so uh, they can be uh, uh, freely available. And I took two examples to, to show you. So for instance, this award uh, have been, uh, this is an ICC award that have been contributed uh, from uh, uh, Karina Goldberg, who is uh, uh, based in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, and uh, the, the, so the award could be uh, integrated in, in the database. Uh, I took also another one, which uh, this one is coming from the US uh, and has been contributed by, uh, by another uh, person. As you see, um, we uh, highlight uh, the name of the person who contributed, as well as the firm, uh, if uh, this person uh, wants to, to, uh, to do it. So we have lawyers uh, participating, but we have also institutions um, that, are, that are participating uh, through this partnership. Um, so uh, one part that I explained is that this information is uh, freely available. And if uh, you are not familiar with USMUNDI's model, uh, maybe I can explain. Um, again, like this, uh, all the documents that we collect on Newsmundi and uh, put on our database are freely available to anyone. So you can go uh, through Google, uh, find the award, read it, uh, download uh, the, the PDF, which is available here, and you will have access to, uh, you will have access to this information. Uh, this is also a, a switch in the model, which is participating, uh, I believe, in, uh, in making uh, international arbitration more transparent. Okay, so third sort of information, lawyers themselves and contribution. So I will, I will stop the screen sharing talk and just continue uh, to, uh, by giving you a few, uh, a few figures. Um, so in terms of uh, award uh, at USMUNDI and in terms of commercial arbitration awards, we could collect uh, up to 900 uh, commercial arbitration awards. It is almost the same quantity of information which is available in investment arbitration. So it, it's quite surprising at the beginning because we believe that there are less um, cases 
Uh, but uh, now uh, we, we have reached the same point and we can expect that uh, commercial arbitration with, will quickly become much more important because uh, there will be uh, more and more cases available every year. And of course, we have not collected uh, everything yet. And what can be also good uh, uh, a figure is, so I told you 900 approximately awards, but half of them have been rendered after 2015. Uh, so we, we, of course, are much more, uh, we, we find much more easily recent awards than uh, old awards. Um, so this is also something that we are developing, but yeah, so it's, it's approximately 90 awards per year uh, that we are able to find at this stage. In terms of repartition, 40% uh, of these awards are ICC uh, awards, 20% are ICDL, 10% uh, are ad hoc arbitration, 9% uh, LCAA, and after uh, we have 2.5% of SCC, SIAC, CETAC, and HCAC awards. Okay. Um, so it's um, it represents, of course, the case load of the institutions uh, and uh, maybe uh, the, the awards that are the most often uh, enforced or, or, or set aside. Um, another statistic that is probably uh, less, uh, more interesting, uh, more funny, is that we have 20% of commercial arbitration awards with a seat in New York. And if you know approximately the percentage of repetition of the seats, you know that New York is not representing 20% of the seats. But because a big source of uh, collection of data for us is uh, the US uh, municipal case law, of course, a New York uh, seat based award are, are sure represented. Then we have 13% of uh, London as a seat, 7% uh, uh, equally for Paris, Singapore, and Geneva. Uh, and uh, and uh, Stockholm at five uh, percent. So I told you approximately ninety uh, commercial arbitration award uh, per year. Uh, that this is what we are able to collect uh, at this stage, uh, and forty percent of them are ICC. So that's approximately thirty-eight uh, award uh, from the ICC uh, per year. If we compare that to the caseload of the ICC, which is approximately between eight hundred to nine hundred uh, cases per, per year. Uh, and maybe a few less if we remove the ones that, uh, that you know, uh, do not produce an award uh, at the end of the day, that's approximately 5% of the awards that are now uh, publicly available. Uh, is it a lot? Uh, is it not a lot? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, it is at least much more than what uh, was uh, available uh, a few years ago. And of course, with uh, also the movement uh, that uh, the, the ICC, uh, uh, the, the Path that the ICC is taking to, to push parties that are willing to publish a, a word uh, to do it in a more e easy way, because that's actually uh, uh, what is uh, the change about, because parties still have the full control on what is happening. But just um, if they want to, it is easier for them. So um, it's maybe too early to do some, uh, some estimations. Uh, but uh, if we just uh, imagine that uh, the ICC uh, will publish 40 awards uh, per year, which is uh, not a lot, right? it's uh, four or five per, uh, per, per month, uh, even less, uh, it, will, uh, it will double this uh, percentage to 10%. And so we'll already have 10% of, of the ICC uh, awards that will be uh, available. And so um, based on that, what I wanted to discuss maybe also with you, uh, maybe to, to open a, di a discussion is, um, is a question that we are often asked by lawyers and we present uh, the, 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 what we are doing now with commercial arbitration is, will it change the way we refer to, uh, to a commercial arbitration award? Will it create you know, an arbitral uh, jurisprudence in commercial arbitration uh, as uh, it happened in, uh, in investment arbitration? Um, <laughs> it's a very difficult question uh, that I will not uh, you know, pretend to be able to, to have a, a full answer. Um, the thing is that so it's not only uh, about uh, making the information um, available, it's about uh, allowing end users to find the relevant information when they need it. And I believe that uh, one of the reasons uh, why uh, uh, you know, people were almost never referring to uh, a commercial arbitration award beyond the lack of accessibility was the huge diversity of the commercial arbitration cases. So already you have a very little part uh, available uh, and you had to find like the award that could be really helpful in your case. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the economic sector can be super different, the applicable law can be totally uh, not, not the same at all, the, the applicable rules, etc. So 
the probability to find uh, an award that would be relevant that you can use to make a point uh, through a proceeding was uh, close to zero. Now that we have a bigger quantity of information, so already more than uh, investment arbitration, plus tools that uh, easily allow you to uh, narrow down your research to the awards that are uh, super relevant, I believe it can change the practice. Uh, if you can, uh, in each of your uh, case, find two, three awards that are exactly about uh, a very similar topic with the same applicable laws, the same economic sector, uh, maybe even the same arbitrators, uh, you will be able to find uh, arguments that uh, will have a strong uh, impact potentially on, the, on your tribunal. Uh, and that's also the, the why we are uh, building a new uh, new filters on new SMD because before it, there were mainly for for investment arbitration, uh, and we are, we are now working on three new filters that will be released probably by the end of this quarter uh, about uh, economic sector, uh, about uh, applicable rules uh, of arbitration, and about applicable law that we have been uh, asked a lot. Uh, by, by lawyers. And so uh, we'll see, actually, we, we will discover uh, as, uh, as yourself uh, if it will be useful, if uh, commercial arbitration lawyers uh, will more uh, refer to, to, um, to case law uh, or not. Um, if it happens, uh, we would welcome it as a, uh, as a positive development uh, because we believe that uh, our vision, at least of uh, international arbitration, is that uh, it is a, a wonderful tool uh, to, to build an international rule of law, uh, which is uh, which has been developing during uh, um, thousands of years, and uh, we believe that the development is not uh, is not over. Uh, that uh, business will more and more refer to arbitration, and and uh, it is becoming a, a real institution um, um, for for uh, the global rule of law, uh, and uh, having a more important predictability uh, of the system. Uh, and uh, better uh, acceptability also of the system by, by the global uh, community. I think uh, that's uh, part of the journey for, for uh, international arbitration, uh, while, you know, preserving its core features that are, that are super important. But uh, once again, the, the uh, confidentiality is not um, uh, an enemy of uh, transparency, and both can be totally um, uh, conciliated. The ICC is, is uh, showing it. Uh, and uh, and there is also further uh, development and just maybe to finish uh, on this point um, one of the key uh, difficulty today is also that if institutions want to publish a legal uh, part of awards that are confidential it, it costs a lot of money because uh, you know manually redacting uh, awards in order to make sure that uh, there is no way to identify the parties it's, uh, it takes days uh, to, to be done. Uh, so maybe the way is to also improve uh, this, uh, this process, uh, to make it easier, to allow institutions to be able to, to publish a more uh, legal part of the world. Um, at USMINI, we have been working on, a, on an algorithm that can pseudonymize automatically uh, the, the award because uh, we want to be in line with GDPR and we want to remove the name of individuals who are not arbitrators, consults, etc., from the documents on our database. Uh, uh, so that's the first step, which is uh, not uh, so complicated. But uh, a second step could be to to try to automize, automatize the possibility to to redact uh, a word. Uh, of course, uh, this part will always have a, a manual verification. But if we can reduce the quantity of work from a few days to to uh, less than an hour, it will be a game changer for sure for for transparency and publication of a. Not a word, but uh, extract uh, of a word. Um, yeah, that's all. And thank you once again for for the invitation. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jr. So actually, you mentioned uh, predictability, and we have a question from the audience from from Mark Jan Malski, who's asking: Is predictability under previous decisions of the arbitrators good or bad? So actually, it's the first question, and the second one is: uh, Should institutions follow certain decisions in order to avoid appointments of arbitrators who dealt with certain matters. So I guess it's uh, kind of for everyone, uh, if maybe starting from JR or Sergey or Irina, as, as you wish. Yeah, so maybe from starting from the institution's perspective, right? <laughs> Okay, uh, I mean, regarding the second part of the question, but uh, 
but institutions should be proactively prohibiting appointments of particular arbitrators. I don't think it's our role as such. It's my personal. I'm not talking, you know, on this on the, uh, on behalf of the SEC. I'm only talking my personal capacity right now. I believe that um, this is not exactly an institution's role as such to to prevent arbitrator to participate in cases where similar issues were discussed. Uh, it's still for the arbitrator to consider whether it, he or she needs to disclose it and make the parties aware of, of that. Um, when we see in our cases that particular arbitrator uh, was acting in the case involving one of the parties, especially if it was recent, and we see that arbitrator Awards, you know, to to mention it in uh, in his his or her disclosure, we usually bring the bring this arbitrator's attention to this point because sometimes people tend to forget uh, to ensure that <laughs> the proper you know disclosure is made and uh, that any potential complex of interests are either avoided or at least disclosed to the parties, so the parties have a right to react on that. So we try, of course, to. To do our job uh, with this, whether to with disclosing, you know, to, with helping arbitrators to do proper disclosures as it's provided by the rules, uh, but at the same time uh, we we cannot dictate. Uh, we are here, you know, to to guide the process to keep, you know, to keep the playing playing field uh, for everyone. Uh, and I, I hope uh, we will continue doing, doing this way. I mean, it's still in my personal view all what I said before. And um, so I will not uh, uh, make an opinion on uh, what the, uh, the institution sh should be uh, doing, but uh, uh, what I can tell you is that, uh, of course, lawyers are, that's one of the information that they are coming to, to find on news media, uh, especially using uh, filters about arbitrator and, and making some researches in, into the search engine. They try to find on which uh, issues, uh, legal issues, uh, factual issues, uh, arbitrator already uh, um, had uh, an experience uh, in order to maybe uh, uh, point out a, a conflict of interest, an issue conflict, or maybe, maybe just uh, to know uh, if they have experience and so if they will be uh, knowledgeable uh, in this, uh, uh, on this particular topic. And maybe also, if I can add, to put it in another level, it's for a question for Jean-Rémy. Do you think that we can just uh, being able to provide uh, lawyers with the reason of arbitrators and some certain topic with like being able to search, or should we go even further towards uh, the predictability of arbitrators' decision given the amount of data that we receive and all this? So it's 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 a big debate, but uh, what do you think? Yeah, so me, I'm pretty uh, straightforward on this topic. I, I don't believe at all uh, on, um, about uh, predictability of, uh, of cases in arbitration. Uh, I think that the diversity, the complexity of the cases uh, are, are, is too much important. And for uh, anyone uh, who have been like a, a secretary of a tribunal or an assistant of a tribunal and who have been how um, um, like uh, the, the interactions between arbitrators. There are so many factors that are not, uh, that you can't uh, know just by reading an award um, uh, that will, at the end of the day, make the decision. Uh, it's impossible uh, to predict. Uh, of course, you can find, or you can do some predictions that we uh, sometimes will be super obvious uh, or predict some part, specific point, like uh, how long do you believe the case will last? Uh, maybe what would be some the damages that could be awarded? But uh, generally speaking, I, I don't believe at all that uh, a prediction uh, could uh, have a, a, an enough um, uh, good quality in, a, in commercial arbitration. And I would even add, even if we would have the total, um, uh, all the awards available and we'll be running algorithm on that, I don't believe the prediction would have uh, a lot of value. Maybe I am wrong. Uh, I would love uh, any uh, tech uh, team to, to show me that I am wrong. But at this moment, I, I don't, uh, I don't believe it. Yet. And that's not what we are trying to do uh, uh, at Usmundi. We more believe in f providing um, uh, all the information and just the useful information to lawyers, so they can make their own analysis based on all the other factors that are not uh, easily available on the text of the document.
May I ask a question to Jean Remy on, on, on with my rights as a, <laughs> as a speaker? I was when you were showing your screen, when you're sharing your screen, and you showed uh, as an example an ICC case. By chance, it was actually the case I'm handling right now. And I know that we published information very recently, like a couple of days ago, I think maybe a week ago. And it is already in your database. I'm very impressed with the quickness. Is it automat automatized the procedure, or you have people engaged who are actually you know, putting it uh, by hand. I'm just quite curious because I was quite impressed by, by the speed. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, this part is, uh, is automated. Uh, so uh, like on the three uh, sources that I presented to you, I think the part which is connected to institution is the one which is the most automated uh, because you already uh, did uh, some structuration uh, work uh, and it's easy uh, for us to just uh, plug uh, ourselves on the on the website of the institutions and to get uh, the information uh, the two other sources are much less automated because even if we can uh, automatically extract some information from for instance pacer um, there are a lot of analysis to be done uh, after the documents have to be processed you know this very bad quality scan document of 200 pages that you that you want to to process at a point uh, and the third one uh, uh, the collaborative partnership is totally manual lawyers are uh, uploading documents uh, IBA, IBA and us uh, are checking and we are uploading now in, in our database so but yeah, yeah this one there is not someone checking every day uh, <laughs> if there are new cases uh, this one is automated yeah. thank you very much very interesting indeed uh, I think that we don't have other questions from the audience. And I think I have a question addressed to Jean Remy and Irina that uh, we discuss how balance is important, balance between confidentiality and transparency. Uh, Jean Remy, uh, in your opinion, for the legal tech companies which are dealing with a huge amount of data information, how do you ensure that the balance is uh, respected? And for Ina, it's the same for the council's perspective that sometimes they just way, well, and I think maybe it's coming to a question to Sergey that how arbitrators are appointed, they just sometimes while looking for information on arbitrators, we are getting too much information, not only about their appointments, their work, but even personal life. So where, where is the border? It's, it's one of the very uh, difficult part uh, of, um, of what we do uh, in finding uh, this balance. Um, generally speaking, I would say that um, confidentiality, uh, we do not consider it to be uh, our own, own responsibility. Uh, so institutions, they decide to put, uh, to make public what the information they want. What we collect uh, through the national case law uh, have been made public uh, through these proceedings and the, these governments, these states are, are taking the responsibility to say, okay, you have to make it public if you want to, to enforce in my country. Uh, and as, for, as a third source of information, uh, the person who is contributed is taking the responsibility uh, to know that uh, there is a confidentiality or not of this document, because for us, it would be impossible to, to verify this information. So at least we know who is contributed. We don't necessarily make it public because they decide uh, if, if it should be ma made public or not. So for confidentiality, that's not really our, um, our problem, if I can say. Uh, sometimes uh, for investment arbitration, we have some governments who are contacting us saying like, oh, this, uh, I would not like this document to be, uh, to be available. We, what we is that it is uh, everywhere on the internet. Uh, the, um, it has been, that, so it's not really, really uh, uh, our job to, to prevent it to be, uh, to be uh, available anymore. Uh, what we are more focusing our effort on is uh, quality and reliability of the information. And for that, we believe in uh, two uh, things. Uh, first, human verification. So even if we automate uh, the most possible uh, part of, uh, of what we do, uh, it's either uh, the algorithm is, is sure of what is uh, extracting as information, or we have a kind of alert and we verify systematically uh, the information that we update uh, on the database, etc. And the second part is uh, process. You know, we we uh, we pay attention to everything we do at the different steps. Uh, the legal data team at USMINDI is super organized, and they do an amazing uh, job. Uh, that's uh, very impressive what they are able to do about finding the information, 
putting in the database, uh, processing, etc. Uh, and uh, so uh, this, uh, yes, yeah, are super organized in order to avoid uh, mistakes uh, that will be um, that could be done. So yeah, that's more what we try to do, and and also what I told you about pseudonymization in order to reduce, you know, uh, the issues for people who are mentioned in this award that uh, you know would not like to be uh, um, publicly available. Yeah. Thank you, jean remy Irina, would you like uh, to add? Yes, um, yes, I would like to add from the perspective of council of. Uh, we always possibilities to disclose information depending on the status we are acting. Uh, for instance, if we are acting as a council, even if we are speaking press release, yes. So everyone like to have a press release about successful outcome of the case. And even if you are making press release, you might disclose certain information that uh, that is confidential concerning arbitration procedure. So if you are making this, of course, you should think about confidentiality principle and then uh, to put press release in the way not to breach this principle of confidentiality, for instance, not to disclose the name of institution, not to disclose the name of the party and give description of the case just in general principles. If we are speaking about obligation of arbitrator to disclose certain information before his appointment in order to avoid conflict of interest, that's another question. And when he is making disclosure, of course, he should bear in mind his obligation to keep a confidential information about the arbitration procedure he was previously involved. And from my point of view, uh, he must and should uh, disclose, for instance, that he was appointed or is involved with the same uh, or one party, like overlapping nomination. I don't think it will be a breach of confidentiality principle. Uh, if you are speaking about arbitration institution, of course, uh, it is first of all for them to decide the scope of information that could be revealed, uh, keeping in mind this confidentiality. And from my point of view, for instance, ICC, a principle, it's a very good uh, approach when they disclose uh, the, um, the, the name of arbitrators, uh, the, the essence of this matter, but do not go into the deep details and the award of arbitration might be publicly available if the parties uh, did not uh, uh, agree to make it confidential. So I think that this borderline uh, depends on each particular case and uh, when we are disclosing certain information we should think about the way uh, and harm to, to our client and to any arbitration prospects. For instance, in Ukraine, we sometimes uh, face difficulties uh, with the tender procedure uh, when tender committee requires to provide evidence uh, of experience in handling similar disputes or uh, performing similar con contracts representing the interests of uh, Ukrainian state-owned companies in uh, arbitration. And when we are approaching international law firms, many of them find it difficult uh, to disclose uh, the name of their client, uh, because it, uh, for them it might be considered as a breach of confidentiality. So we, we have uh, this uh, very difficult question and I think that the answer and the way out in each case depends uh, on the status in which we are acting, uh, the purpose for which we need to disclose certain information and we always should do that not to make certain harm to the whole arbitration procedure. Thank you, Irina. Uh, Sergey, we are waiting for your comments and very curious what you have to say about transparency in arbitrator's appointment at the ICC. Ah, okay, I see. Uh, before moving to that point, I would like just to make a couple of uh, observations on the issues raised uh, by Irina, for example. Uh, so I've seen some of my cases 
uh, when one of the parties applied so-called press release campaigns, when they would publish particular statements in order to get some public you know, attention to the issue and this way to put potentially to put pressure on the other side and on tribunal deciding on the issue, which might be politically sensitive, economically sensitive for certain nations, for example. And uh, then basically the obvious reply from another party would be a request for tribunal to that uh, the tribunal orders basically to delete these releases and uh, to order to, for the party to refrain from any further publications on particular issues. And then basically there is a whole debate uh, between the parties and tribunal has to decide uh, on whether, whether, the, whether sh the confidentiality should be respected or whether it's in public good and you know, to, to allow these kind of releases and what, where are the borders and confidentiality uh, as such. And then many factors play for intervenal decision. First of all, applicable law, then our own rules, which also provide for conventionality, of course, uh, terms of reference signed by the parties, because often uh, parties agree on, in terms of reference that the matter should be state confidential or part of it, or they precise how exactly, or there is no confidentiality clause in terms of reference. Also the contract sometimes provides in arbitration clause or even as a separate clause that any matters within the contract and any disputes arising out of the contract should be held confidential, for example. So then there is an obligation for the party to keep, keep the matters confidential based on these provisions. Or there is none. So it's always you know case by case basis, depending on applicable law and the factors I just mentioned. And also another point is uh, rarely, but we see sometimes uh, when the parties submit challenges or objections to confirmations based on public statements made uh, by the traders before the case started uh, on their, for example, uh, you know, position on certain issues or how they refer to how patriotic they are for their countries. And when, when for example, the state is involved who nominates the ca this candidate afterwards, this sometimes can be used uh, against this candidate. Uh, I mean, not always successfully. <laughs> uh, that, for example, he's he or she's biased uh, because of that of that statement. Uh, so, if somebody is involved uh, as uh, arbitration lawyer who aspires to become an arbitrator in one day, he or she should be careful with public statements because now everything is recorded uh, to be to be sure that nothing is used afterwards against this person when he or she is appointed. Uh, and regarding appointments, yeah, we basically touched upon this uh, during our presentation on everything is more or less connected to disclosure to be made uh, when it comes to transparency in, in terms of appointment. And um, yeah, we on our side, we obviously try to to, to keep uh, the balance and also to make sure that uh, the obligations are respected by tribunal in order to uh, to protect parties' rights and interest in the case. Thank you. Maybe I have a, a little question uh, for Sergey uh, because you, you mentioned uh, uh, the political situation that can be important, uh, you know, when a party is uh, trying to pressuring another. Uh, and um, so as far as I know, uh, the ICC is having much more investment arbitration the past year that it has been uh, in, in the past. I, my question would be just, do you did you had the impression that the fact to have more investment arbitration uh, change a bit sometimes the typology of the cases or what was happening? It's more you know out of my interest to 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 uh, see if you yeah if investment arbitration cases involve more uh, issues like this like the one you you imagine for instance uh, compared to commercial arbitration cases. Very, very good question. Uh, honestly, I mean, I believe logically what you said, it, it should, there should be coloration between, you know, more investments or more state interest involved. Normally uh, more issues like uh, campaigns, et cetera, was trying to put pressure on the state or a state trying to put pressure on some big you know, investor as well. It happens both ways can arise. Uh, actually, funny enough, uh, what I mentioned, in these examples arose in commercial cases in which I handled, um, not not in not even in investment cases. So I believe that 
coloration should exist and more investment cases we get, more issues should arise. But even commercial cases already produce these issues and we have plenty. And then, and then it's for the parties and tribunals to deal with them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh and um, so thanks, uh, Sergey. And I can maybe also add a little point uh, on what uh, I said about uh, um, the fact that we pseudonymize now uh, documents. Uh, the question arised about who should we pseudonymize or not. And so with the decisions that we took is to pseudonymize uh, everyone except so arbitrators, consuls, uh, experts uh, intervening. So only experts appointed by uh, you know one party to, to make a point like uh, as an independent expert, so not uh, someone working at the company, for instance, uh, and then uh, secretaries of the tribunal. Um, because we believe that there is a legitimate interest in informing the public about uh, this person, but not for the other individuals. But of course, I think it will be subject to debates, to discussions. So I think that uh, for the ICC, when you chose to create a database, it's a more also a question of uh, informing the parties, discussing and you know making clear the rules of the game before uh, the, the cases should start. Uh, so I don't know yeah, what other institutions are, are thinking of that, if the uh, name of lawyers should be uh, something that uh, you know should be available or not. That's uh, an open question probably on which uh, we will be able to discuss in the coming years. Uh, you are muted. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and that's why when the case starts, uh, we, in, we, we give the time for the parties to react. So we tell, we plan to publish this information on our website in our official communication. And you have this amount of days or months to react. And, uh, and then we see, yeah, normally people are very happy to be included in the database. And sometimes we get uh, emails like, so why so far my law firm is still not mentioned or why I'm as an arbitrator, I'm still not on your website, the case is already pending. We explain yes, but we have you know some deadlines to respect. And blah. so usually people are very happy to be included because it's you know it's promotion, it's uh, new clients. People see that the kind of law firm is doing ICC cases, it's, it's great. Uh, but of course, we also have uh, objections which are filed immediately as soon as they get this letter, the client reports, we don't want anything to be public, then nothing is public. So I, I think it's a very balanced approach where we try to, you know, respect uh, public interest, uh, what you guys are doing, a very important job indeed. But also if party doesn't want, then it's obviously party first and public interest later. Yes, so uh i guess we don't have any other questions from the audience uh i don't know if we'd like to continue our interacting interaction uh jr and uh, sergey but uh, i'd like to yes uh, no, maybe i can uh, i can ask uh, one question uh, for irina because uh, um, the past uh, weeks uh, we have been discussing with uh, arbitrators uh, who told us uh, and we are a bit uh, pissed off because uh, now with uh, all this information available, we are more and more challenged uh, for conflicts of interest. And there is a kind of switch in mind of uh, counsel. So they, they find connections uh, between us and the firm and thing. Uh, and they give us a list of connections and they say, okay, uh, prove that you are not conflicted. Uh, right, you, you know, uh, in their mind, that it's just to be the role of the council to prove that there is a conflict, not a re uh, just a connection. And, um, what do you think and how, how do you see potentially a, a shift happening? And uh, uh, did you add already uh, this kind of, of case uh, uh, in, in your cases? Well, uh, well, actually, uh, so it's it's difficult sometimes to, to shift and to make this borderline that you are a lawyer and uh, uh, or at the same time you are acting as an arbitrator. But of course, uh, so each uh, firm should um, have its own rules concerning the possibility of lawyer to accept a nomination as an arbitrators in order to keep this confidentiality principle. And of course, as Sergey mentioned. For instance, uh, that uh, law firm is associated uh, heavily with the specific lawyers that is acting as arbitrator. So, of course, when you act as a lawyer and you want to be arbitrator, you should keep in mind that you might be conflicted in numerous instances or your company might be conflicted in numerous instances. 
so you should discuss this internally and you should accept the risk either you understand that you would not be able to accept many appointments because it would not uh, comply with the interest of your company or uh, vice versa your company should refuse to handle certain matter because you are acting as an arbitrator so it is always a uh, matter of discussion and you should find a balance depending on the each circumstances Thank you, Rina, and I guess thanks everyone yeah, for thanks. such for such an interactive and insightful discussion on such an interesting topic. Uh, I'd like once again thank you all, and uh, once again Ukrainian Arbitration Association for uh, making this webinar happen, and Anna. Uh, so I the floor to to conclude uh, this one. Thank thank you, Dmitro. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, it was very interesting indeed. <laughs> to discuss this topic. Yeah. Thank and you, so, everyone, thank you. for attention, for interesting questions. So it was very interesting conversation. Thanks. Thank and you. Have, have a good evening, afternoon, by the way. Depending on the time zone, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. Bye, Rob. Bye.